Um, so I have like updated the My Notre Dame through the end of the semester. So this week we're going to be working on 5.3. Next week we're going to do our test review and take our chapter 5 test and then we'll start the exam review stuff the week after that. Um, as things get a little bit closer, I'll give you an idea of like exam format and all that kind of jazz and how that'll work. Um, everybody cool with that? So that's all there. Um, next. Today, we're going to start talking about section 5.3. So, 5.3 sounds a little scary because what we're doing here for the most part is... Proof. Now, can we stop talking, guys? Thanks. So the kind of proof that I'm going to ask you to do here is different than what you did in geometry. Because the kind of proof that we're going to do here is going to be algebraic rather than geometric. So the format we'll use will be a little bit different. Okay? Um, so what I'm doing right now is I'm filling out this notes number three or whatever. If you wanted to follow along on your one note, that's fine. If you're just taking notes, that's cool too. Whatever floats your boat, I'm just letting you know what I'm doing right now. Um, okay, so again, in section three, what we're going to be talking about is proving identities, or sometimes it's referred to as verifying. Those two words could be used interchangeable. So when we talk about this, um, really our proof begins with one side, and ends with the other. Now, it doesn't matter which side you start with and which side you end with, but we'll see when we do some examples that there's some tips that usually one side is easier than the other in terms of a starting place. So we say the proof ends when uh, the two sides are the same. And the steps you use is your proof. So the steps that you're going to show, that you're going to use, that is your proof. Okay, so we'll have something like this. Now, this first one that we're going to do doesn't involve any trigonometry, right? We're just going to do a simplified version of this that just is all algebra, no trigonometry in this first example. Um, but this would be an example of something to prove, just two things that are equal to each other. Now the idea is I want to take one side and turn it into the other side. 
okay? And the work that I use to do that is my proof. In general, it's going to be easier to start with the more complicated side and end with the simpler side. I say that in general, not always does that need to be the case, but typically that would be the case. If I look at this, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 minus x squared minus 1 over x plus 1 equals 2. Uh, which side is the more complicated side, the left-hand side or the right-hand side? <coughs> Should be really obvious. Which looks more complicated, the left-hand side or the right-hand side? <coughs> the left, right? Or correct? Certainly that looks like a lot more going on than just the number two. So that's going to be where we'll start. All right. Now, the tools that I have available to me are my usual algebraic simplifying tools. So I can factor or FOIL or distribute or make a common denominator or combine like terms. I can do things like that. If you're looking at this problem, does anybody see an obvious thing to do algebraically. <coughs> I'll give you a hint. It's going to involve those. Does that look familiar, x squared minus 1? This would be an Algebra 2 question when I say, does this look familiar? So looking back through notes is probably not going to be helpful right now. This would be looking back in your memory from Algebra 2. What's the one thing that you guys spent a lot of time doing in Algebra 2 last year? Okay. What's another thing you spent a lot of time on? Starts with an F. Factoring, right? X squared minus 1, does that factor? Right? It's a quadratic, right? So it possibly could factor. How does that factor? So what you'd want to remember is the difference of two squares factoring pattern. Right, if you have something in the form a squared minus b squared, that factors to a minus b times a plus b, correct? Everybody's okay with that? So what we have is we have our a is x and our b is 1. So how is x squared minus 1 going to factor? Use the pattern that I've just written down. x minus 1, x plus 1. So that's what I'm going to do as my first step, is I'm going to factor those quadratics. So 
So far, so good. Does that factoring pattern look familiar now that we pointed out to you? It's a good one to remember. It comes up a lot. All right. Um, now, if we go back, or if what we look at what we have here, so we have two fractions, correct? Uh, what's something that we can do with a fraction? Name some stuff that you can do to simplify a fraction. So when you say cancel, Emma, you really mean like reduce, right? That's what you're meaning? So if I have the fraction like 2 over 4, how does that reduce? That goes down to 1 half. Now, the way you did that was you say, okay, 4 is really 2 times 2, so I can cancel those factors. And really, I have 1 over 1 times 2, or 1 half. Does that look familiar? Now, can we do that same thing with what we have in red? So if I look at the first fraction, is there a factor in common with the numerator and denominator? Yes, what is it? x minus 1. And if I look at the second fraction, is there a factor in common with the numerator and denominator? Yes, what is it? X plus one. So now I'm left with that. Does everybody agree? You shouldn't because I've made a mistake. I made a mistake on purpose to illustrate to you how easy it is to make this mistake. Where does the parenthesis need to be? Yeah, in front of the x minus 1. Why is that important? Because that negative sign needs to distribute. Very good. Everybody's okay with that? What should we do next? Combine like terms. So I have an x and a negative x. Those will just cancel each other out. And I have a 1 plus 1, which is 2. And where were we trying to get 2? 2. So we're done. In mathematics, usually when we complete a proof, we put a little box that we color in at the end to mark that we've completed our proof. And just to illustrate to you guys, what is our proof? It's this work that's connecting the left-hand side to the right-hand side. That is the part, that is our proof. It's just the symbols that show you how I get from one side to the other. Everybody's okay with that? Not as scary as a geometric proof, right? Where you're not quoting theorems. All right. Let's go and look at another example. This one will be will include some trigonometric parts to it. So let's update our strategy here a little bit. We're still going to start with the more complicated side. And when we say more complicated, addition and subtraction is considered more complicated than multiplication and division.
So the first thing we typically want to do is look for algebraic things to do. So by algebraic, we mean like factor or foil or um, make a common denominator or combine like terms or um, reduce or, you know, et cetera. Then, after we've decided that we've done the algebra, any algebraic things we might be able to do, then it's time to start looking for trig identities from our identity sheet that we had shown you guys last time, or the time before, I guess, even. Um, And then the third point here is if we're unsure, is to convert everything into in terms of sine and cosine. So that would be our last thing to do. If we're stuck, we're not sure what to do identity-wise, typically converting everything in terms of sine and cosine isn't usually a real, isn't a bad choice. It may not always be the best one, but it usually is never a bad one. So let's do another example. So again, the first thing we want to do is decide which side is more complicated, the left-hand side or the right-hand side. You guys say the left, because we had said before that addition and subtraction is more complicated than a multiplication division. So we're going to start with this side. Now my first suggestion is to look for algebraic things to do. Now here I just have two things that are added together, right? Are they like terms? No. Do they share any factor in common? No, because they're just one factor each. So is there anything algebraic to do here? No. Okay. So the next thing we would do is look for an identity to use. Are we unsure of an identity to use? What should we do if we're unsure? Try to rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my identity sheet and look for an identity for tangent and for cotangent that are include only things or factors of sine and cosine. So if I go through and I look, Those are the only places where tangent is equal to only sine and cosine, and cotangent is equal to only sine and cosine. Do you guys agree with that? You go through and you can check, but that's the only place on the identity sheet where tangent and cotangent are equaling just sines and cosines. Everybody's okay? So that's what I, those are the identities I'm going to use is Q1 and Q2. Now I'm going to write above the equal sign, Q1 and Q2. So if you're going back and looking at my notes, you know what I did to get here. So we've converted everything into sines and cosines now. 
So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to look for an algebraic thing to do. Well, now I have two fractions that are being added together, correct? In order to add two fractions, what do I have to have? Common denominator. Common denominator. Excellent. So what would the common denominator be between sine x over cosine x plus cosine x over sine x? Well, let's ask a simpler question, maybe. If I was going to be adding like 1 half and um, 5 thirds, what would the common denominator there be? You guys say 6, right? How did you come up with 6? Just 2 times 3, right? Because both of the fact or both of the denominators are relatively prime to each other. The common denominator will just be the product of the two denominators. So in this case, our common denominator will be cosine times sine. Exactly right. So what do I need to multiply the first fraction by? Sine over sine. And the second fraction will be cosine over cosine. So all I did over here is I just made some common denominators. So I'll just abbreviate CD over the equal sign. All right, what's sine x times sine x? It's not 2 sine x. Sine squared x, yes. If I had sine x plus sine x, that would be 2 sine x. And then what's uh, cosine x times cosine x? It's cosine squared x. And that's all over our common denominator, which was sine x times cosine x. Yes. Sure. Okay. Oh, boy. So the next thing we're going to do, again, go back and look for an algebra thing. What do I have right now? I have one fraction, right? The only thing I could do to simplify one fraction is possibly reducing it, correct? Now, to get that reduced, I would need the numerator written as a multiplication problem rather than an addition problem. Is everybody okay with that? Can I factor sine squared plus cosine squared? Is that a factoring pattern we recognize? If I wanted to do like x squared plus 4, is that factorable? It is not factorable. This is a sum of two squares. Those things are not factorable. Okay, so there's no factoring I can do on this. So I cannot reduce this. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So since I can't reduce that, what should I do? I have to look for an identity. So I'm going to go to my identity sheet. Now, the piece that sticks, or is there any piece of this that stick out to you? Well, as soon as I see things that are squares that are being added to each other, what set of identities would I want to look at? The Pythagoreans. Do any of those look useful to us? Yeah, look at that. Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. Okay, well, let's use that then. So I can replace sine squared plus cosine squared with just 1. Is 
Is that okay with everybody? Now, let's keep in mind where we're trying to get to. What are, how do we know when we're done? What does this thing have to equal? Cosecant times secant. What is cosecant again the same as? One over sine. And what is secant the same as? Oh! And what do I have here? Well, 1 over sine times cosine is really just the same as this, right? If I'm just multiplying fractions, you multiply the tops together and the bottoms together. So 1 over sine times 1 over cosine must be 1 over sine times cosine. Everybody's okay? So then I can use my two reciprocal identities there. I always forget which one do I want here. Uh, looks like R4 and R5. Sure. All right. Let's do another. Is this helpful, kind of walking through these things really slowly together? I'm trying to be really careful and purposeful and not go fast here. I know that this can be difficult at the beginning because you have very little intuition to fall back on. But I want to make sure that when we're doing this, I'm really kind of talking things through about how I'm making my decisions, like what are my options and why am I choosing the route that I'm doing. Am I doing a good job of that so far? If you don't understand why I did something or why I didn't do something else or could I have done this or that or anything like that, please feel free to interrupt and ask. Okay, Those are very important questions, not only for you but for everybody as they help build out intuition. The hardest part about these kinds of problems is just like what's okay to do and what's not okay to do. Or what should I do in this case? What would be a good idea to do versus like a not very helpful thing to do? That's going to be the hardest part. And to get good at that really comes down to doing two things. Like seeing what are good things to do. So seeing examples like watching Mr. Kulik work through some stuff and do things like a really neat and purposeful way. And then two spending some time and making a mess out of stuff and getting lost and confused and like frustrated working on your own. Now, I don't think we're ready quite yet to get lost and frustrated working on our own yet, but we're getting close, right? I think a few more examples and we'll probably be ready to start trying a couple of these on our own. Um, So some other strategies. Mm -hmm. This difference of two squares factoring pattern. Is often a useful. Bridge. To the Pythagorean identities. So basically what we're saying is as soon as we do this kind of a factoring pattern, we're probably going to end up with 
using a Pythagorean. Not always, but often that'll be the case. So as soon as I start seeing that difference of two squares, either I'm multiplying it out or making trying to do some factoring, Pythagoreans are often going to be involved. And then my last hint here is just to kind of to keep in mind where we're trying to get to. So keep your eye on the prize. Where are we trying to get to? Okay. Our next example. Which side would we want to start with? The left-hand side or the right-hand side? I would agree with the left-hand side. Certainly looks more complicated. We have two fractions being added versus just like some stuff being multiplied together. So it, again, addition and subtraction is more complicated than multiplication and division. Okay, so again, we start by looking for algebraic stuff to do. What do we have right now? I just have two fractions that are being added together. In order to add two fractions, what do we have to have? Common denominator. So between the denominators of secant x minus 1 and secant x plus 1, what would the common denominator be? Well, what if it was just one half plus one third? What would the common denominator be? Six. How'd you get six? Two times three, right? Because they're relatively prime. Secant x minus one, secant x plus one are relatively prime. What's the common denominator going to be? Secant x squared. Okay, you're. I would say we skipped a step in doing that. That's correct still. I'm not going to fault that. But really, secant x minus 1 times secant x plus 1. And when we multiply that out, that does indeed give us what Boyd had said. Um, although it's a little bit further than I would have gone um, showing examples for students where we're at right now. But that's OK, Boyd. That's still correct. Yes. Say hi to Nate. So again, all we did there is we made some common denominator. So our denominator should be secant x plus 1 times secant x minus 1. What will the numerator be? It's going to be secant x plus 1 times 1 plus, okay, well, oops. Secant x plus 1 times 1 is just secant x plus 1. I have my plus sign. Then I have 1 times secant x minus 1. Everybody okay with how I wrote that fraction? Well, hey, look at that numerator. What can I do up there?
there's some like terms that we could combine, right? What can go together? Well, I have a plus one and a minus one. Those just cancel out. And what's secant x plus secant x? Not secant x, two secant x's, yes. With addition, the coefficient changes. With multiplication, the exponent will change. And then we might as well foil out that denominator at the same time, as Boyd had suggested before and we mentioned earlier. So we're down to one fraction now, correct? What can I do with one fraction? Really the only algebraic thing I could do is to reduce. reduce. Now, is there any reducing I can do here? Not as it's currently written. What's the problem? Because I have secants in the numerator and in the denominator. Why can't I reduce those? Because one is secant squared. Not because it's secant squared, but because it's not a multiplication problem on the bottom. That's an addition and subtraction problem, right? If I had like 2 over 1 plus 2, I can't just do that and write it as 1, right? That's crazy, right? 2 over 1 plus 2 is 2 thirds, right? Everybody agree with that? So if I try to factor this, what am I going to end up with? Just back to where I was before, right? So let's not do that. Okay, so there's no algebraic thing to do is what this boils down to. So what should I do? I now look for an identity. Because I had a difference of two squares right here, what identity should I have in mind? I want to go look at the Pythagoreans. So looking at the numerator, I'm looking for a Pythagorean that involves the secant squared or a 1. Sure. So what I'm going to use is P3, and I'm going to replace my secant squared with tangent squared x plus 1. Well, hey, look at that. What do you notice in the denominator? Yeah, if I combine those like terms, Everybody feel okay so far? All right. Now again, we have a single fraction. If I'm to simplify this, the only thing I could do to simplify it would be to reduce. Is there any reducing I can do here? Definitely not, because they're all separate terms. 
Okay, so it's going to be identity time for us. So the way that I would think about this, I would think about it, well, let's think about where we're trying to end up with. What are we trying to end up with? We want that, correct? Well, what's nice is I already see my two. Everybody agree with that? But I don't have either a cotangent x or a cosecant x right there. Everybody agree? So I'm just going to write those as like, I'm going to write this fraction now as the product of three things so I can maybe kind of see what's going on. Is everybody okay that I can write 2 secant over tangent squared as 2 times a secant times a 1 over tangent squared? That all seems fine, and all I did was just like some rearranging. Now I see something nice. So looking at what I'm trying to get to, I need to have a cotangent in there, right? And what I have, I have 1 over tangent squared. So I know I can use which reciprocal identity is going to turn that tangent into a cotangent? R3, well, it's really, I'm going the other way. I'm using R6, right? I have 1 over tangent squared is turning into cotangent squared. Everybody's okay. Well, that's great. And now I'm going to do a little bit more rearranging because if I look at my final answer, I know I'm supposed to have a cotangent in it. Right now I have a cotangent squared. What's really the same thing as cotangent squared, though? Just cotangent times cotangent, right? So I'm going to think about 2 times cotangent, and that part's my keeping part. And now I know somehow secant times cotangent needs to turn into cosecant. Everybody could with that? Okay, well, let's take a look at what we have from an identity point. Ooh, cotangent is the same as cosecant times secant. That'll do nicely. So all I'm doing is I'm replacing cotangent just one of them. I don't have to replace both of them.
right? So all that happened there, cotangent turned into cosecant over secant, and we reduced or multiplied or simplified, whatever you want to call that, what we just did. I'm going to call it reducing because things got crossed out, like canceled out like that from multiplication. Well, you know, close enough. That go okay, guys? Does this feel like it's getting a little bit more familiar as to like what to do? I think I have one more example for us to do together. Um, well, I have two more examples. My bad. That's okay, though. All right. Okay, let's take a look, see, at this one. No new strategies necessary to talk about for this. We're just going to use things we've done before. How do we start? By choosing the more complicated side. Now this is a little bit tricky. Which side is the more complicated side? The right side is the more complicated side because this you can write as one over cosine plus sine over cosine. That's an addition problem technically. The other one you cannot do the same thing. You can't break a fraction with in the add addition or subtraction in the denominator. You can only do that with the numerator. So I would start with the left-hand side here. Oh, these are T's. This was, felt like such a good idea when I was writing this, all these lessons and stuff, to just like change the variables all the time. And boy, when it comes down to like writing the notes and stuff again, I just have always made it no end that I did this. But here we are. Okay, so we have this written as a single fraction. We recognize that we could write it as the sum of two different fractions, but like they have a common denominator anyway, so that's probably not going to be super helpful to me. Um, so algebraically, do I have anything to do here? Is there anything to reduce? No, man, what the heck should I do with this? Well, I and the prize, where are we trying to go to? We want to end up with cosine t over 1 minus sine t, correct? So what do I need to have in my denominator at the end? It's got to have a 1 minus sine t in the denominator. Everybody agree? Okay, well, I'm going to put it in there right now. Everybody's okay with that? Now, what am I going to have to do in the numerator here? I'm going to foil that out. Notice here on this problem, I multiplied by 1 minus sine t, not to make a common denominator. It was literally because I know that I have to have this in my answer. I don't see any way to just turn cosine t into that. What? How the heck am I going to get that? Well, I'm just going to put it in there and see what happens. Everybody's okay there? Did you notice... 
What did we have here, Pat? Sure. These two green pieces that we multiplied together. That was a difference of two squares, wasn't it? What identity often follows a difference of two squares? A Pythagorean. So I'm going to be looking at the 1 minus sine squared part and seeing if there's a good Pythagorean to use. So I want one that involves a 1 and a sine squared. Oh, ho, ho, look at that. P1 involves a 1 and a sine squared. So what I'm going to do in this problem is I'm going to take the 1 and replace it with the sine squared plus cosine squared. You sometimes one note. All right. Everybody's doing okay? What can we do now? So I used that Pythagorean. What did that get me, though? Look at the numerator. Is there like terms to combine? I have a sine squared and a minus sine squared. I can just combine those like terms, leaving me with a cosine squared t over cosine t times 1 minus sine t. We're back down to a single fraction again, folks. If I want to simplify a single fraction, what can I do? Reduce. Is this in a form that I can do reducing? Yes, because everything is being multiplied. What can reduce then? I can cancel a cosine t from the bottom with one of the cosine t's on the top and look at what that leaves me with. Is that exactly what I'm looking for? What? That's pretty neat. So again, all we did on that last step was a little reducing. Is this going okay? So again, while we're doing these, was it probably 75% algebra stuff, 25% trig identity? Has that been about kind of where we've been living? All right, last one.
<laughs> so our last strategy can be with your stuck, sometimes it's easier to work on both sides of the equation and kind of meet in the middle. Okay. All right. Uh, which side would you want to start with here? Left hand or right hand? I yeah, I mean I'd say they're really kind of about the same, to be honest with you. Um personally, given what's going on here, I think that the right hand side will be a little easier to kind of see our way to a, a stopping point in the middle. Um so I'm gonna start with that one. But they're about, I would say they're equally as complicated. So if we're starting with the right hand side here, Is there anything algebraic to do? Should be something obvious, right? Yeah, I can just distribute the cotangent. Okay. Now, when I did that distributing, there were no like terms to combine, right? So I think it should be pretty clear after that that like it's identity time, since I didn't end up with like something squared or whatever, like nothing combined. Um, so I want to look at this piece. And then I want to look at this piece. I'm going to kind of in, look at them separately. Um, the fact that cotangent is involved in each of them um, kind of makes me feel like I want to be looking at the cotangent part more than the secant part or the tangent part. Um, so if I look first at cotangent times secant, I'm going to look for an identity that relates cotangent to secant. Oh, look at that. Cotangent is cosecant over secant. Well, that seems like a pretty good deal. Let's use that. And then if I look at the other piece, I want a, some or identity that relates cotangent to tangent. Well, that I know right away. That's one of our reciprocals, right? Cotangent is 1 over tangent. So I'll use that as well. Now look what happens now, what can we do? The first fraction, the secants can cancel. The second fraction, the tangents can cancel. So 
So a little bit of reducing. And we're with cosecant u minus 1. That feels like a good place to stop there. And now I'm going to work on this left-hand side and see if I can get to the uh, 1 minus co or yeah, uh, cosecant plus 1 or minus 1. Minus one. All right, I'm going to just speed this up real quick here um, since we're almost out of time. Cotangent squared is the Pythagorean R2, and I can say that is cosecant squared U minus 1. That is a difference of two squares. So I'll factor that. Stop talking, please. And I can reduce those. And I'm left with cosecant u minus 1. And since these are both equal to the same thing, I am done. Let me just move that back out so you can see kind of the whole thing there. For tomorrow, work on 47 through 52. I'm going to call on some peoples to write some answers on the board tomorrow for these, and we're going to kind of look at what people did, give some individual and group feedback on what you did. So make sure you try to do some of the, and when I say tomorrow, I mean next class, not really tomorrow. Um, make sure you uh, spend some time working on this because you could be one of the randomly called people. So you want to have something that you can write up there that's not going to be embarrassing. And it's okay to have it wrong. I'm expecting everyone to have wrong answers. But, like, do some work on it. Do the best you can. Okay, Mr. Kulik will come back. We'll give feedback. We'll talk about what you did that was good ideas or bad ideas or what you could have done differently or if there's other ways to do things. Um, and that's what we'll do next class is we're just going to kind of let you guys do some stuff in real – or show me what you did in real time, and then we'll um, give you guys some feedback and write out the correct answers so everyone will have the correct answers for these. And then I'll give you another, you know, six of them or whatever to work on, and then you'll do the same thing. We'll do that for a couple of days, okay? Um, while you're doing these problems, what would be, what is often gonna be helpful to have out in front of you? Your identity sheet, right? Have your identity sheet out. Have that at hand, easy to look at. You'll need your identities quite frequently, not on every step you do. Again, we saw that it was probably like two thirds or three quarters of the steps we did were just like algebra things. But, you know, we have a third to a quarter of our steps are probably these identities. So having your identity sheet out and handy will be helpful to you. Okay. If you're stuck, go back and look at some of the strategies that we wrote out on the notes. Should be, should be helpful, okay? And on these 47 through 52, like, do it authentically for yourself. If it's wrong and I call on you, write me up, you write up a bunch of gibberish, that's okay. It's important that you're getting feedback as to, like, what you thought to do was okay or not okay. I think that's really important to get it, and it should be your authentic work, right? Like, don't feel pressured to, like, I need someone to help me do this because I don't want to be embarrassed. Just, it's okay. We'll, be all, we'll all get embarrassed together. It's not like Mr. Kulik's never made a mistake in here, right? It's okay. It's okay. All right. I'm stopping talking. <laughs>